start sir. Yeah, sure, sure. Good morning, one and all. Sitara welcomes you to its Zoom sessions. Today the topic is purchase policy and the speaker is Sri Ankur Srivastav, Deputy Vigilance Officer, South Central Railway, Sikhrabad. The brief introduction of Sri Ankur Srivastav. Mr. Ankur Srivastav has done his B.Tech from IIT Mumbai in Mechanical Engineering. Subsequently, he has cleared the Master of Laws from the National Law School, Bangalore. He has worked in Tata Motors as well as at the ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. In the year 2005, Sri Ankur cleared the IRSS examination. And since then, he has been working as, he worked in several capacities in South Central areas in Hyderabad, namely as AMM Dalabada, SMM, CMW, Senior DMM in Hyderabad, and Deputy CMM General at South Central Railway. Before joining, 2018 as the Chief Vigilance Officer South Central Airways in We are indeed fortunate to have and share this experiences of such policy and I hope that all the participants will be benefited by this lecture today. Over to Mr. Ankur Srivastava. Yeah, thank you once again and a very good morning to everybody. I am fortunate that I get an opportunity to, to you know, discuss and talk to uh, such a nice group of people. It's, it's more of a give and take where I learn from you and you learn from me. In fact, you know, learning is fun. Fun is learning. So, 
the same spirit today, I would like this session to be more of an interactive session where we, you know, kind of learn from each other. And to add to that, you know, as I said, that learning is fun. So I am very happy to see that we still have our, uh, you know, the funny bone intact and still there are, uh, we, we do enjoy and we do relish having a little bit of fun when we are learning. In fact, one person here I see has the name Joe Biden. President of United States listening to my lecture, and I am really honored. Thank you so much, sir. Right. Uh, so, uh, I am sure I am visible and audible. Let me share my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So today's uh, session is on stores procurement policy. Before I start telling from my side, let me take your feedback. What is it that you would like to know about stores procurement policy? So I will try to cover those topics or emphasize on them when I am going to that topic in my presentation. Anything that you would like me to discuss on stores procurement policy or any other stores matter for that? Uh, I would 
avoid Hindi because there will be others who may not be very conversant with Hindi. So my session will be mostly in English. Okay, so uh, as I said, an offer can also be an offer to buy. I offer to buy a land, piece of land from you at 10 lakh rupees. The moment you accept that offer, a contract is formed between the two offers. Okay? Let us look at our tenders. In tenders, I am telling everybody that I am, I want to buy, let's say, uh, 100 kilograms of colds. Okay? And then a form comes out, uh, you know, three forms come in the tender, come in the tender, and they give their uh, bids. Okay? Is, is it to be taken as my offer to buy 100 colds? And they accepting my offer and then saying that I will, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, okay to sell you at just this uh, rate. Please explain in Hindi also. Okay. ठीक है. अभी हम contract की legal definition के बारे में बात कर रहे हैं. तो contract में एक offer होना चाहिए. Somebody should offer. Somebody should accept the offer. Offer जब accept होता है, तो contract बनता है. है ना? और offer के acceptance के साथ एक और चीज़ ज़रूरी थी वैलिड कंसीडरेशन मतलब अगर हम किसी कुछ दे रहे हैं वापस हमें भी कुछ मिलना चाहिए अगर मैं किसी को वापस दे रहा हूँ सेव दे रहा हूँ तो मुझे पैसे मिलने चाहिए डेट इस द फुल आइडिया बिहाइंड कॉन्ट्रैक्ट लेट मी नॉट स्ट्रेस दिस फर्दर अ टेंडर इज नॉट एन इनविटेशन � फिर मैं उस ऑफर को एक्सेप्ट करूंगा। डेट इस वाइल्ड। वे रिसीव ऑफर्स फ्रॉम द फॉर्म्स एंड वे एक्सेप्ट द ऑफर। द स्पोर्ट्स, द रेलवे ऑफिसर्स वे एक्सेप्ट द ऑफर। दें द कॉन्ट्रैक्ट इट्स। ओके, सो दिस द लीगल डिफरेंशन ऑफ़ व्हाट्स अ कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एंड हाउ डस अ टेंडर फिट इन इन दिस you know, in government we are stuck to this tendering system, L1 system and we always, you know, because of this we do not get good quality material, we do not get good rates, we have to buy it higher rates. But believe me, tenders is a time-tested way to obtain competitive bids. Even private sectors, for small purchases they will not go for tenders. But big purchases, even private sector goes for tendering. The tender is a very time-tested and a scientific manner competitive bids. Okay. At the same time, for government sector, there is an additional requirement of giving transparency in the process and equal opportunity. We have to show that we equally treated here. Okay. Now, uh, private sector, this requirement is not there. Even this requirement is very nicely met through tenders, as long as we stick to the tender conditions. Okay. That is why purchasing through tenders in itself is not a bad thing, really. It's a very nice way of purchasing things. It is the additional things that we, you know, we impose upon ourselves which create the problems that we sometimes see. Before I go into details, let me just highlight a few types of tenders that we deal with. The first is open advertised tender, where the tender, the, all the firms, all, all people in this uh, country are uh, eligible, um, not eligible, but are allowed to participate. They are allowed to participate in the tender to give their offers. And of course, whether that offer will be found eligible or not will depend on my tender's conditions. I'll come to that later. Then there is a bulleted tender. This concept has now gone off. Uh, so I will not really discuss this in detail because I, I don't think any railway is going for bulleted tenders. We have limited tender where we have a limited set of panel of a few vendors and we invite offers only from these few vendors. Any offer that comes from anybody else is considered an unsolicited offer and it will not, in the audit will not be accepted. In fact, in IRE case, there is no scope of getting an unsolicited offer. Then we have what about the special limited tender, it's nothing other than a limited tender. Only normal limited tender, there is a price limit, there is a limit of value. For 5 lakhs, above that, I cannot do limited tenders. But special limited tenders, I can go beyond that. It is done for specific reasons. For example, items which are to be procured from approved agencies approved sources like, uh, you know, RDS approved sources, CLW approved sources, etc. or in emergencies, etc., etc., or safety items that. We also have possibility of single tender. Now, single tender you will appreciate 
restricts the competition severely. Basically, there is no competition. So single tender powers are very limited and as we adopted only for very small value less than 5,000 or else up to a certain value with the pool of higher authorities given in SOP up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, say 4 lakhs, 8 lakhs. But the main thing is, if the approval has to be done by quite senior states or, uh, you know, PCR, I mean, HOD level officers have to approve those single tenders. There is also, this is something which we usually do not do or not discuss. There is also a possibility of doing without them. The stores code clearly mentions that GM, general manager, can dispense off with tendering in any service cases. That is also available. I will not say it is a, you know, adopted even. Any kind of urgency, I'm sure a single tender is sufficient to, uh, you know, really do it in, a, in the fastest manner possible. However, said that, there is provision available, distance of tendering, GMs. These are the different types of tenders that are being processed in railways. Now, as I said, there are powers given for, us, for different uh, levels of uh, officers. Uh, let me just, you know, make a digest or make a summary of that as to what all things require approvals which are given in stores in, in the uh, okay. First is approval of AAC. The AAC for stock items needs to be approved by a stores officer. There are categories given A, B, C category based on the based on the annual purchase value. A AAC approval pass every delegated five crore below is GG above that is S D M C. So, approval of AAC has to be done by an officer as per the SOP documents. Second approval that is required is approval for floating of tender. We usually call it tender schedule approval, which means somebody has to look at the tender schedule, the quantity, consignees, just a moment of chat, okay. explain global tender, okay, fine, Savananji, you want to know what's global tender, I explain that. Let me finish this slide first. Uh, so, uh, approval of tender has to be given. What all is being approved with tender should be given? The quantity, the uh, description of the item, the consignees, the eligibility criteria and other conditions, delivery schedule, even, uh, you know, the panel of forms, if it is a limited tender, even the panel of forms is being approved when the tender is being This also has to be done as per SOP. So, please, uh, the, the stores officer who approves the tender should not for that matter even a works tender. The person is approving all these facts in a tender. Okay. After this, the tender is open. The tender is considered either directly by the officer for direct acceptance or by tender committee. And then it goes to the accepting authority, the AA or the direct accepting authority. Okay. Then again, acceptance of the offer is again as per the schedule of okay. So you see the main three places where SOP comes in, there is approval of AC, approval of tender schedule, and then acceptance of the After this, of course, there is signing of contracts. Powers are there who can sign a contract of what value. And then subsequently, if some modification has to be given in the contract, who's authorized to approve such modification? Usually it is the same person who accepted the contract and what Usually, there is, some there is one little thing which is available. Usually, as I said, usually as a matter of principle, no deviations from the tender conditions or tender distribution should be accepted. However, some specific provisions have been allowed to accept deviations. These include accepting deviation in the warranty clause, accepting deviation from IRS conditions, and something like that, some more like this. There also specific powers have been given in a, a particular deviation. For example, you would have heard, those who are in account must have heard of this kind of a deviation of changing inspection clause from, let's say, third party inspection of rights to consignment inspection. Sometimes that is done. For this specific powers have been given to kind of this kind of a modification of conditions. Uh, okay, then. Uh, uh, Mr. Savanan was uh, asking about global tenders. 
See, usually when we are floating tenders, indigenous tenders, that means only farms resident in India are eligible to participate. Okay? In global tender, even foreign firms become eligible to participate. Until say foreign firms through agents can they participate? Yes, foreign firms if they are voting through their agents, the agents can participate in the Indian rupees. In global tenders, participation is also possible in foreign denomination, in foreign currency. So there the risk of foreign currency uh, exchange in some cases may be born to real risk. Okay? Other than that, there is no uh, you know, procedurally there is no difference in the It's just that who is eligible to participate and whose approval is required. Now, for example, recently it has come that anything below 200 francs. If we want to go for uh, global tender, approval has to be taken from ministry. So, approval level for a global tender and, you know, who are all are eligible to participate, that is the only difference. Otherwise, procedurally, how the tender will be evaluated, etc., I the same. AAC, I'm sure some of you would have heard of AAC. If anybody has heard, you can just give me a thumbs up. Okay. AAC is anticipated annual consumption, which means for every stock item, how much am I, how much is my expected consumption next year? There are different rules as to how the AAC will be fixed and how it will be. Uh, you know, uh, better and finally for the least kind of Should uh, you mentioned average annual consumption. Well, you know the concept, concept, but the you know literal definition that we use is anticipated annual, anticipated annual. But it's not average of the past. It is what I anticipate for the future. That's what the anticipated annual. Most of you are from sports, uh, from accounts departments. Let me uh, just share what is the role of accounts. Right? What is the role of accounts? In how, uh, sorry sir, how AAC is calculated? Uh, calculated? Okay, I'll tell there, there are uh, various methods of using the AAC. The first basis is, as Sri Shalvanji mentioned, find the weighted average consumption of the past three years. Okay. First thing what we do is we calculate the weighted average annual consumption of the past three years. This is what average annual consumption would be, weighted average I say that. Okay. Now, it is not that always the weighted average annual consumption of the past years. You also have to see if my post firm was increasing or if the item is supposed to get obsolete. Or if the coach where this item is being this is getting is you know its, its inventory is coming down, or for some other reason the consumption is going up. So based on the past consumption and also based on an administrative understanding of how the consumption trend will be in the future. Recording in progress. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. Based on these two factors, we come to an anticipated annual consumption for the future. Okay. So. Average annual consumption is an important factor in deciding what is the anticipated annual consumption, but that's not the only thing. Okay? So, as I said, accounts department ka role kya hai? Uh, first of all, if there's a new stock item, then the stocking application forms need to be went to associate accounts. At that time, you can check whether the AC fits properly. Um, I don't know, probably that's not a part of the slides, but there's another very important as to how to fix the AC correctly, especially for accounts people. When the proposal comes to you for uh, stocking of a new item or for revision of AC, how to see, what all the factors to see whether the AC has been pleased in you. So that is a very interesting thing. Maybe you know, sometime else we can take that decision. And of course, uh, for existing items, AC every year for wedding will come to accounts. For A category items, it is mandatory. For B category items, if the consumption is, if the ancillary AC is more than 10% of past consumption, then it goes. We have seen the AAC part, AAC approval done. Now we have the approval of tender. As I have told you, what all things are being approved in the tender approval, the mode of tender. Am I going for open tender, limited tender, special limited tender, bulletin tender, global tender? Mode of tendering is, all, is approved at this stage. Tender description, what is the item I am purchasing, technical specifications, commercial conditions, 
eligibility criteria based on which he says whether an offer is eligible or not eligible. Panel of sources in case of a limited or single tender. All these things are approved when we say that the tender schedule is being approved. Okay? And the power to approve is based on the estimated value. Whatever the estimated value, based on the last purchase rate, we estimate the value. And based on that, the approval is done. Acceptance of offers. Now, please understand here, there's a very important concept. Sometimes we miss it. This acceptance level is based on value of accepted offer. Let me give you an example. Suppose L1 firm, suppose the acceptance limit of, uh, let's say, senior skill officer is 10,000. Now, L1 firm quotes a rate of 9,90,000 plus GST 18%. Now, sometimes I have seen a few people said that the basic rate is 9 lakh 90 thousand within my acceptance. So I can accept that. No. The acceptance level, as I have mentioned here, is based on the total value, including all charges, tax, rate, everything. Based on the total value only, the acceptance level is to be decided, not based on the basic value. Second, it is based on the accepted offer. L1 offer is 9 lakh 98 thousand, all inclusive. L2 offer is 10 lakh 2000, all inclusive. If I want to accept L2 offer, which means suppose L1 offer is not eligible, and I want to accept L2 offer, acceptance is not decided by the value of L1. It is decided by the value of the offer being accepted. So if I want to accept L2 offer, I have to see the value of L2 offer. If it is within my company, then only I can accept it. Otherwise, I have to give it to a higher level company, a higher level direct access. For the HLTC, higher level tender. When we give it to a higher level tender committee, there is another important concept that we must bear in mind. Whenever we give it, we say that the case is limited to higher level tender committee for de novo consideration. Now, is anybody aware of what is the meaning of de novo consideration? I would request some interaction here. Is anybody aware what is the meaning of de novo consideration? To analyze, it, uh, to analyze it as a fresh piece. To analyze it fresh? Okay, very good. Uh, fresh or from beginning? Uh, some uh, from beginning, sir. From beginning, yeah, from beginning. Which means, uh, let me share this piece now. Suppose I am senior skill officer. I say L1 offer is not eligible. And I want to accept L2 offer, but L2 offer exceeds my competence. So I remit it to the next higher, that means the J grade officer would request. A J grade officer cannot say that, okay, L1 offer has been passed over by a senior scale officer. I am considering L2 offer, it is a little action. No. J grade officer has to start the consideration from the beginning. He has to consider the L1 offer. He has to make up his own mind whether L1 is eligible or not. Eligible. Yes, in my opinion, too, L1 is not an eligible offer. Therefore, I am passing over and accepting the L1 cannot rely on the consideration of the senior skill officer in passing over the element. He has to make his own independent judgment. He has to consider all the offers from the beginning. Just a moment. There. High level in the company, correct? correct. I'm thankful, I'm thank uh, uh, really thankful I'm getting a very good response today from you. And then there are some special acceptance powers for uh, special cases like single tender and emergencies. Some cases of purchase from PSUs, there are lax powers, for example, from ordinance factories, can be accepted at a lower level without the need of a TCS. Et cetera, et cetera. So those kind of special powers are there, which are very few and parliamentary, so we not worry about them. Uh, okay, now acceptance of offers. When I am accepting an offer, what all things do I have to look at? What all things do I have to look at? I have to look at the technical suitability of the offer, which means the item is suitable as per my tender description. Okay, please understand here that the check is with the tender description and specifications and not as per my requirement. Many times in divisional or depot purchases, what we notice is, suppose I have asked for something, let's say, uh, Let's say any equipment with a 5,000 uh, empty battery, okay? Now the 
often comes for a 3000 mAh pack. The user pack says for me 3000 is okay, I don't mind 3000. So it is acceptable. It may be acceptable to the user department, that is fine. But it is not suitable as per the tender description or specifications. And that's why it says 5000 minimum. As far as the tender is concerned, I cannot accept an offer for 3000. I can retender, revise my specifications and then accept it. But I cannot accept it with the specifications as they are presently in the tender. Just because an item is acceptable to the user does not mean it is suitable as per the tender conditions. Okay? Please understand the difference between these two concepts. Second thing that we see is commercial responsiveness of the dog. If I am asked for a delivery in two months and the box is I'll deliver in 12 months, I can always say that the offer is not responsive to my requirements. If I say that it was delivered to my doorstep and he says I will deliver it, how will I use it? Such offers are, if they are not commercially unresponsive, they are commercially unresponsive, they also will not uh, be eligible to the product. And of course, the most important thing is eligibility criteria. Eligibility criteria is supposed to identify firms who have the capacity to supply. I do not want to place an order on any Tom, Dick and Harry who will end up not supplying and I will end up not supplying. So eligibility criteria is there in open tender to reduce the, you know, the, the, the universe of eligible firms, those who actually have the capacity to supply and therefore compliance with the eligibility criteria is a must. It's a must and at the same time, correct eligibility criteria should be included in the tender. If my eligibility criteria is very restricted, I am restricting the competition so as only one or two other eligible will be eligible. If it is very broad, you know, again I can get offered from uh, undeserving uh, firms and I may end up not getting the particular firm. So, technical specifications, commercial conditions and eligibility criteria. These three things are the heart of a tender. If we spend some time on this, those who are in stores, even those who are in accounts, if these things we spend some time before tendering, our job is 80% done, tender finalization would be a breeze. If we do not look at these aspects, just blindly float the tender, this point of an half and then the return button is, whatever then comes, I just copy that description and float the tender. It is bound in most of the cases. Number one, the complications and acceptance. Number two, getting in making infrastructure purchases or getting such like that. So three things: technical specifications, commercial conditions, and eligibility criteria is the crux of tendering. That is where the art, that is where the, the skill of the tender processing officer and the officials lies. Then at the time of acceptance, you also have to see the reasonability of rates. Please understand. The word used is reasonability of rates. I am not asking somebody to purchase at the best rates possible. No. The tender itself, the open tender mechanism itself is supposed to bring competitive bids. The officer is only supposed to assess whether the rate is reasonable or not. Is it unreasonably high? That is the only thing that the officer is supposed to assess and uh, it is not the best rate. Sometimes what happens is, you know, somebody has uh, assessed the rate as 2% higher to rate as even in a period of two days and he says that the rate is reasonable. Later on, somebody will say, Are you have purchased 2% higher than what was purchased two days back. Which means you have not, you have made a loss of 2% of the rate. Please, no, that is not the way to look at it. Reasonability of the rates is the only thing. If the tender was an open tender, if 10 firms have participated and still the rates have gone up at 2%, well, market rates may vary from time to time. So we should not hold a person responsible for, for variation in market rates. But yes, if he has not assessed the rates properly. For example, same case, but suppose in that time the market rate has actually gone down by 10%, but still he says that 2% is reasonable. Then he can be questioned that your reasonability assessment was not okay? Inter-say ranking and quantity distribution are the conditions. Sports quantity distribution is important because we have a lot of conditions like spreading criteria, MSE preference, Make in India preference. A lot of quantity distribution happens. So whether we are doing it rightly, whether we are ranking the firms inter se correctly, because ranking has to be done sometimes, you know, based on not only on the price of the item, but also on the price of AMC that the firm has quoted. And we have to use the discounting 
So that the proper interstate ranking has been done, etc., has to be seen at the time of transformation. And of course, then we require negotiation, then we have to go for region. Then these are the decisions that the tender committee and the accepting authority has to yeah. Again, what is the role of accounts in acceptance of offers? First of all, you will be a part of the tender committee. So all these things I mentioned that you have to see, you have to see as a part of the tender committee. And then at this stage of betting off. Now, what is the purpose of betting off? Betting of POs is basically an exercise to ensure that the purchase order made is in consonance with the acceptance order on the market. Okay? Purchase order is in consonance with the acceptance order on the market. The acceptance or otherwise has already been discussed by the CC. The acceptable they have been discussed by the CC. We only have to see that the purchase order is in consonance with what was decided earlier by the competent market. Uh, this slide has been needed because we don't have any source of this. Not really accepting deviations, I told you that there are some uh, some possibility of acceptance or deviations like division warranty, division from IRS conditions, or deviation in inspection clause. These powers are there in SOP. You can you know refer to them as a win. Post fact or similar that not be relevant. Really. Modification of contracts, you can extend delivery period. Uh, no, we can uh, give liquidated damages if it is merited, if it is on firm's fault, etc. Et uh, whenever we are purchasing, yeah. uh, after issuing of uh, purchase order, we can uh, change the uh, term and condition of uh, uh, purchase order. If we have okay. plan, it will require uh, waiting of uh, finance. Very good question. Uh, any uh, modification of the contract will require waiting of finance. Unless it's a you know uh, delivery extension with liquid damage, there's an exception. Even the delivery delivery extension with liquid damages, it need not be waited by accounts. Okay. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, uh, let me also share with you something that modification of the contract is mostly done on very uh, you know uh, limited grounds. I cannot make any modification that I want. You cannot modify the description. You cannot modify, uh, you know, maybe the condition of supply. These are all things which are financial implications. And if we do such modifications, our tender itself can get it can be a deviation, a vitiation of the tender itself. Which means the other firm can say that uh, uh, you know, had you allowed conditions, had you allowed me to supply in six months instead of two months, I might have put it at a lower rate. Okay, so. Modification of contract should be done, should be done on very limited grounds, mostly delivery extension. Maybe some other uh, okay, this change of rights inspection clause also provisions available, so you do not put accounts. Other than that, it should usually not be done at all. If it is done, uh, there should be very cogent reasons for it. Okay, and when you are extending the delivery period, you must look at the rates received in other railways or other routes. Suppose lower rates have been received. Can consider whether it is beneficial to extend the delivery period at the present rates or whether it is beneficial to offer the lower rates to the firm before being given the ticket charge. That aspect must be seen when we are extending the delivery period. Then, as I said, clarification amendments. No modification should ordinarily be allowed that has financial implications. So, only a very clarificatory amendment can be made, that is all. Suppose you have written some drawing number. And the drawing number is not clear in the PO, you can maybe that is that is kind of all you know kind of thing that you can do in this. Please do not accept any major modification of the specifications which may have financial implications because that is prone to complaints and that is prone to uh, you know uh, being questioned. But then of course modification includes cancellation. In cancellation, we can cancel a PO because of firm's default or because of other reasons, sometimes both generates. But as firm's default, now of course we can recover SD. Okay, so I have given you a brief of what the tender purchases are like. Now let us see, I told you there have to be commercial conditions for the tenders. Let us look at the commercial conditions which are a standard part of all sports tenders. Okay, and I will discuss these conditions in some. There are three 
is standard condition to this force tendon. This is what kind of something happens. IRS condition in betting of who you are watching. Virvati asks betting of who you are watching. Okay, uh, Virbalji, as I as I mentioned, uh, betting of PO, I am betting the purchase order, which means I am betting whether the purchase order prepared is as per the acceptance record and compromise. That is why you will see there is a board's instruction that wherever purchase order has been automatically generated based on the acceptance record in IREPS, betting is not required. So, vetting is there for the sole purpose of ascertaining that the purchase order that is prepared is in consonance with acceptance and of the product of the Okay? That is the difficulty. Okay, now we are, we are back to standard conditions. There are three conditions instructions to tenderers, general tender conditions, and the IRS conditions of the contract. IRS, the full form is Indian Railway Standard Conditions of the contract. I will come in detail about this. Now, why do we have three different standard conditions? We all know and works in this, we have something called GCC, General Conditions of Contract, and that serves the whole purpose. In stores, somehow, over a period of years, we have split into three different sets of conditions, and there is a reason for this. Instruction to tenderers are conditions which tell tenderers or potential tenderers how they should go, okay. what weight they should write in which column, what GST they should report, what uh, you know, weight they should report what terms of uh, delivery they should quote, etc. How they should quote in their offer, those instructions are available to General tender conditions, these are the conditions of evaluation of tender. This tells the tenders how their offer will be evaluated, how will the ranking be done, how will they be held eligible or suitable, how much proportion of quantity will be given to them if they are held one, how much quantity will be given to them if they are held one. So how their offer will be evaluated is given in general and conditions. And IRS conditions of contract, these are the conditions of the contract. This tells the tenderers <coughs> what will be the conditions that govern the contract if a contract is formed between the railway and the railway. So you see there are three different stages. First is how you should participate in the tender. Second, how your tender shall be evaluated by railways. And third, if your offer is accepted, the contract that is formed, how is that contract to be These three stages, they are three different tender conditions. Now let us see what it is some for tender specific conditions. These are general standard conditions which are there in all tenders. So tender specific conditions will be technical specifications very obvious. Some commercial conditions. For example, suppose I am buying oxygen cylinders. Uh, I used to buy oxygen cylinders but not now in the COVID time. I used to buy other industries. So we have to look at a lot of things like what will be the you know free period. Cylinders when I am taking, I am taking on a free rent. So I don't have to pay the rent for the cylinder. So for how much period should I keep the cylinders? How many cylinders can I keep in my inventory? Etc. Et These kind of things have to be part of commercial conditions depending on case to case basis. Okay? And then of course most important uh, tender is conditions. Now in stores usually we have three or four standard entry criteria. One is the procurement of food agency. Second is, uh, you know, procurement based on past performance capacity. So now let's see these conditions, the standard conditions. Instructions tenders. Instructions tenders tell them how to submit the offers. What are the important conditions available there? Conditions regarding EMD. What EMD they have to submit, in which form they have to submit. What SD they have to submit, which form they have to submit, the bank is acceptable or not, the MD is acceptable or not. What documents they must submit with offer, for example, they must submit their Udyo uh, Vadar, Udyo Madhar, if they want the MSC conference and so on and so forth. Uh, how can they access the drawings and specifications we mentioned in our tender uh, instruction documents? What are the conditions regarding tax and duties? What tax they should report? <coughs> Be responsible if they misclassify the tax and so on and so forth. How should they put the price variation? Sometimes we have price variation costs. That means the price of the contract will vary if some index in the market varies, let's say uh, copper index or something like that. So how will that variation happen? That is also indicated. Or how should you put for that variation? That is also indicated in the construction. Then we go to 
tell them in the conditions. Please tell them how the offers will be evaluated. What are the important conditions? First and foremost, the right of railways to dispose of them. Please understand, there are Supreme Court judgments that say that each offer made to government has a right to be fairly considered. Okay? Which means if somebody has given me an offer and if I have purchased that item and the offer is otherwise eligible, reasonable and everything is there, I must accept that offer. That is why, to avoid that situation, we always retain the right to dispose the tender as we need fit. So, for example, after opening the tender, sometimes, you know, the consignor says, no, I don't want the bill anymore. So, under this clause, I can say that I am discharged the tender, even though Elgin offer was suitable, reasonable in every other way eligible. Okay? Right? Dispose of tender in any way railway means. Then there are conditions of splitting of quantity. If I get offers, even though I am L I get an Elgin offer from X firm, he knows that he will not get full order, but there is a split criteria. He will get only 60% or 65% at some point in the next year. Purchase restriction from approved sources that this item I want to put the sources. And if so, what are the conditions come to that? Quantity option clause, sometimes they put option clause that I can increase or decrease the quantity up to plus or minus 50 percent Consideration of delivery should be quoted, sometimes we say that gate delivery should be not be accepted case of cartel formation, we tell them that if your offer appears to be a case of cartel, how will your offer be evaluated? Not only that, how your offer will be handled. That is what action we can take against your offer in the form of a cartel. Preference clauses, how your offer will be considered for MSC preference, for make India preference, and of course, statutory variation clause. Now, how many of you are aware of statutory variation clause? No need to worry. Uh, we will discuss this in detail later on. Achha, by the way, I am sorry, uh, this is a question which I should have asked in the very beginning. Uh, has anybody of, is anybody of you right now working with stores finance or stores accounts? Yes, sir. I am junior ISA. Junior ISA. So, you are handling uh, stores uh, accounts, right? Yes, sir. Uh, scrap, uh, scrap, sales, something. Now, as I said, some important conditions. Government Compensation Act, ESIC, PF, etc. Rajiv Kumarji's question is Government Compensation Act, ESIC, PF, etc. Uh, well, I can. Uh, I, I can probably uh, discuss that separately with you, but because these these particular legislation, Workmen's Competition Act, ESIC and PM, etc., they are not applicable to stores contracts. But in stores contracts, we do not have a contract to labor working in our premises or working on uh, our work. It is basically a case of supply. And in case of supplies, these acts do not apply. So it's not relevant to stores purchase policy. It is very relevant for work standards or service standards. Maybe uh, Rajiv Kumarji, we can discuss on the last Okay. Uh, yeah. This, this is course I will discuss. There is one person who is unmuted. Kindly mute yourself. So first of all, predetermined split clause, I think let us not go into the list, let us take the clauses one by one. Predetermined split clause. Uh, in stores tenders, we include this clause sometimes where we say that even if the lowest offer is poor is eligible, I reserve the right not to give him the full order. I will split the quantity between him and one more firm, maybe or two more firms, to ensure availability of material. It means if one firm fails, at least I'll get something from the other firm. Okay? The split clause is very common in source contracts, although you'll see it rarely in works contracts. And it is given there in our tender conditions itself. The basic idea is, I mean the basis, the, the summary is, if the clause is included, and if L1 and L2, both of them, they are eligible. If their rate is within 3%, then I split means them as 60 is to 40. 
you will have more than 3 percent as well as 65 and 30. Okay. Uh, now, if split trial is included, splitting is the norm, but it is not necessary. The PC can record cogent reasons for not going for splitting and give order on a single form, even if split trial is included. Similarly, if split trial is not included, even then, if cogent reasons exist, the, the reasons are, are available in our uh, splendor conditions, then the uh, PC members can decide split orders even though the split is not important. Liquidated damages, damages for delayed supply, that is what it means in railway parlance. So of course, liquidated damages is a term in contract act also and there it has a different meaning. But I will not really get into that for you right now. LD belongs to which standard condition? Okay. Uh, liquidated damage is a part of the higher expenses contract. So, please explain the spreading cross and get to this If you have any questions, ask me. Uh, so, is there yeah. uh, one source to uh, see the TC member uh, before a splitting one? What should see the TC member before a splitting? Okay, as a uh, okay, fine, I get the question. Uh, if we decided splitting clause is available in the tender, then splitting is the norm. TC member need not give any special attention as to whether splitting is needed or not needed. The tender approving authority at the initial time has taken a reason to call that in this case normally splitting should be done. So unless there are cogent reasons not to split, TC should simply go ahead and split. If there are cogent reasons not to split, say for example, L1 form is a very reliable form, has been supplied within time for the past five years. While L2 form the test is, a, is an untested form that has never supplied in the past for this item and has been a delayed supply for other items. In such cases, TC can record reasons and can say that I do not want to split. However, if if that's has to reward cogent reasons for splitting and the reasons are limited. Number one, suppose L1 form does not have adequate capacity or has poor performance as the past reports. On these limited grounds only, the, uh, you know, the recommendation. So you see, the, the default rule is different if the clause is included or if the clause is not If we decide a splitting clause is included, the default rule, the norm is not included, the default rule is not included. But in both the cases, you can record reasons and do the other. Okay, now liquidated damages, contractor, liquidated damages are not by way of penalty, a sum equivalent for half percent for each week, it shall not exceed 10 percent of the total contract value. Recently, there is also a clarification that this half percent is only for the value of unsupplied goods. So, for example, if the order is for 200 numbers, 100 number has already been supplied and only 100 number is delayed. Then liquidated damages shall be levied only for half percent of the balance 100 number, not for the full contract. Okay. Okay. Sir, sir, how, how is the contract, sir? Whether it is charged to instrument account or traffic earning? How is LD accounted? It is whether it is charged to stock adjustment account or goes to traffic earning. The amount covered from LD. I will go to earnings. No, sir, in our railway, the patties is there, sir. That's why we are asking. In our railway, patties is there, sir. It is charged to directly traffic earning. I am not in abstract jet, sir. Okay, I, I, I am not in support in this. I will have to pick it up. But my understanding says that a liquidated damage is in the contract price. I am seeing the reduced amount of So my contract has been modified by the contract That is all. Okay. It, it's not a piece of earnings, so I don't know that the can as a uh, uh, whether it is booked or sir, it's talking about 7191 sir. 7191 did it. Uh, why should it book? 
in statutory taxes in statutory levies during the currency of the contract that change will be borne by the purchaser by the retailer so for example suppose at the time of the opening the gst rate of some item was 5% okay the tender opened in january i placed a purchase order and the delivery period is in july now somewhere in june government changes the gst rate from 5% to 18% then the firm can rightfully claim that change in tax from 5% to 18% from railways of course railways must take a certificate and should get convinced that additional benefit that accrues to the firm because of higher offset available should be passed on to railways but idea is but the idea is that uh, uh, you know uh, any increase in statutory levies during the currency of the contract should be borne by the purchaser this is available in our general tender conditions this is also i'm sorry it's such a tender this is also a part of sales of goods act sale of goods act says unless an intention appears to the contrary it means the default rule is that statutory variation clause applies but if we want it not to apply we must specifically include it in our contract wording that statutory variation shall not apply and the seller shall bear any taxes one part of it there is one thing called statutory variation tax variation there is another thing called misclassification let us take the same example the firm quoted the gst of 5% in the month of january but he misclassified the goods the actual rate on that time for a different taxes was 18%. Later on, he comes and says that no, now the tax authorities tell me that the tax rate for this item is 18%. So please give me 18% in the statutory variation. That is not allowed. That is a misclassification. It means he misclassified at the time of bidding. In the earlier case, he classified correctly, but for the same category, the tax rate has changed. In this case, the tax rate has not changed. He has changed the category itself. Such misclassification is not to be allowed for. So statutory variation is allowed. Statutory, uh, I mean, misclassification is not allowed. Okay, so there's a lot of interest for explaining in Hindi. I am going to tell you in Hindi. Mein statutory variation. Bata. Statutory variation clause says that if the tax rate changes, it changes during the contract. So, whatever increase or decrease is, it will be purchased by the purchaser. सेलर को बियर नहीं करना पड़ेगा पांच परसेंट से अठारह परसेंट चेंज हो गया तो परचेजर यानी रेलवे बियर करेगा रेलवे हायर देते हैं रेलवे को यह चेक करना है कि अगर कुछ हायर सेट ऑफ अवेलेबल हो जाता है तो वो रेलवे को पास हो जाता है लेकिन अगर फर्म ने वोटिंग के टाइम पे ही मिसक्लासीफाई कर दिया उसी टाइम पर उसने गलत रेट वोट कर दिया अठारह परसेंट था लेकिन उसने गलत एक्सेशन वोट पे पांच परसेंट वोट कर दिया उसको हम मिसक्लासीफिकेशन इस केस में अगर वो अठारह परसेंट चेंज करते हैं तो वो नहीं मिलेगी स्टैच्यूटरी वेरिएशन टैक्स वेरिएशन अलाउड है टैक्स मिक्स क्लासिफिकेशन का पेमेंट अलाउड है ठीक है तो नाउ वी अंडरस्टैंड स्टैच्यूटरी वेरिएशन टर्म एन इंपॉर्टेंट टर्म ये वॉज ड्यूरिंग करेंसी ऑफ द कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एंड दैट इज वेयर डिनाइल क्रॉस कम्स लोग डिनाइल क्रॉस कर जाते हैं डिनाइल क्रॉस कहता है इट सेज दैट इफ आफ्टर द एक्सपायरी ऑफ ओरिजिनल डिलीवरी पीरियड एक्सटेंड द डिलीवरी पीरियड then the following conditions shall apply if the tax rates increase after the currency of the contract such increase shall be borne by the supplier by the seller okay if similarly suppose there is a price variation clause in my tender if the price variation increases after the currency of the contract it shall be to the account of the supplier however if any of these decrease then the rate shall be the same example the example will make it clear same case the firm quoted 5% the dp was in july okay we extended the delivery period with the nal clause up to let's say september and the government changed the tax rate from 5% to 18% in the month of august that is in the extended delivery period now because the delivery period was extended with the nal clause so this increase in tax 5% to 18% shall not be payable to the supplier That is the whole idea of denial clause, and that is why denial clause is very important whenever we are explaining the delivery period. That increase in statutory variations or increase in price variation 
Google of PVC formula shall not be proved by the purchaser by the real estate. However, if initial tax quoted was 18%, again the newly extended from July to September, and in August, the real I mean, government reduces the tax from 18 to 5%, then railway shall take the benefit. I don't have to pay 18% original tax rate. I will pay at 5% too. So railway will get the benefit if tax rate comes down. But railway will not be an additional expenditure if tax rate goes up. Okay? This is a denial clause. It is important that most of us have this. And they said the supplier will not be entitled to any benefit because of upward, I mean, variation reduced. So, if the is a punch wall, then the supplier will benefit from the railway. Ko benefit. Damages for failure of supplier are being cut. General damages is over. There is no concern. I mean, so I'm going to invest which is not in damages. Now, what happens is there is security deposit in all cases. And if the firm has given security deposit, he won't need it. If the firm has not given security deposit, then damages shall be levied to the firm to, the, to such extent that which is equal to the amount of SD which he would have been applicable for in case of non -exam. So simple is, the SD applicable in the contract. If he has given it, he will get it. If he has given it, he will get it. Then the amount of damages will be given. So now it's very simple, no risk purchase. No general damages, it can simply be made this. Quantity option clause. We have a lot of money in this clause. That the railway reserves the right to increase the quantity by 30% or decrease the quantity by 30% within the currency of the contract. A recent clarification has been, a recent clarification, that this increase or decrease can be done within the currency of the contract even if the firm has already supplied the full quantity of the contract. If the contract was delivered in July, the firm has marked the material supply. Then, in June, we can operate the 30% option class and the quantity can be enhanced. If we want to reduce it, we can reduce it. We already discussed it. Then, the chairman. Somebody asked about the reverse option. So before I go to uh, Jeff, let me discuss the reverse option also. Just to focus. Achha, let us see. We have, we have discussed splitting clause, we have discussed LD, we have discussed denial clause, we have discussed general damages. I have not discussed risk purchase because now it's not no longer applicable. Quantity option clause we have discussed, statutory variation clause we have discussed, price variation clause is basically a clause which says that the price, the basic price of the material can change based on some index. There are formulas for this, what is input credit? Final commodity is asked for input credit, I will tell you. Price vision clause, it allows the basic price to change based on some underlying index. I will not get into the details, it is basically deriving a formula and using that formula to calculate the updated basic price for the supply. Preferential purchase for MSCs, now there is a very important instruction says that micro and small enterprises should be given preferences in purchase. The preferences have been, have been defined as to what is the limit of purchase preference and when it shall be given. Those detailed rules are not specific today. Because number one, we have a bit of a of time. And number two, because none of you are really handling with stores purchases, so it may not be relevant for you. Then, preferential purchase for indigenous supply, there is another set of rules says that purchase preference shall be given for items which have, you know, more than a certain local content. We have three categories of suppliers. Class 1 local suppliers that have more than 50 percent indigenous content. Class 2 suppliers that have more than 50 percent indigenous content. And other non-local suppliers. There are separate rules as to who is eligible to participate in this status and uh, under what conditions can these be allowed and those are empowered to allow. These are detailed set of guidelines all available. Uh, I will not really get into that because, you know, detailed uh, minutity of the guidelines may not really concern you right now if you are not handling stores or stores or stores. Somebody asked about reverse auction. Reverse auction is a method of purchase which I have message. Risk purchase. Risk purchase meant if somebody has failed, I would uh, Make another purchase for the same item with the same terms and conditions and if I purchase it at a higher rate, the difference I can recover from the default of the 
that was the idea of this purchase, but now it's no longer applicable because now all source contracts and clauses either you pay either you forfeit as D or you leave it damages equivalent to the So there's no idea of this purchase now in the institution as well. Uh, there's a reverse auction in the middle of the Now what happens in auction is the bidder will bid higher and higher in the game. Okay? But in reverse auction, the seller will bid lower and lower and lower and whoever bids the lowest gets the money. That is in a natural reverse auction. Of course, there are a lot of details, general matters. It will be a two-bid process. First, there will be an initial price bid. We will determine the eligibility of the offers. Based on that, we will choose a certain percentage of the offers who are eligible as the bids who qualify for the financial bids. Financial bids, they will bid, you know, there will be a reverse auction. Whoever comes the lowest gets the order. There's the clause for splitting there. There's the clause for separate orders for developmental and regular orders. There's also clause for giving separate orders for MSC, separate orders for uh, Bacon India. Believe me, it becomes a mess. So many, uh, you know, preferences being given. I'm not saying giving preferences is a mess. But calculation the quantity as to how much you that creates a big, uh, you know, complicated table and calculation cal calculations for that reason. So, let's not get into the details. The idea is, instead of asking the offers and accepting the lowest eligible offer, we first ask the offers, decide that so and so forms are eligible or suitable for going for a reverse option. And then those forms try to, try to bid lower and lower. So, there's a competition getting built up. We try to bid lower to get the order and it is expected that through this process we get more complicated. So the idea of reverse auction is to buy things at the most complicated price. Okay, reverse auction. Then somebody asked me about input credit. I am sure accounts officers, accounts uh, uh, will first with input credit. For the benefit of others, you tell you. Uh, GST is what is called uh, a value added tax. That's added value. And how it is done is like this. There is somebody on unmute. Somebody on unmute can please move your sequence. Unless you have a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, what happens is, suppose I buy uh, a raw material at 100 rupees. And on the 100 rupees, I also pay a GST of 15%. Or let me take easy figures, 5%. So I pay 105 rupees to the seller. Now I use this raw material to make something and I sell it at 200 rupees. And again, the tax rate on 200 rupees is 5%. So I take from the purchaser 110 rupees. Right? But value added take tax means in the second transaction, the tax should be levy only on the value added. By me is 200 minus 100. 100 was the property for on which all the tax was paid. So I have to pay tax only on the balance 100 rupees, which is 5 rupees. How is this actually done is what the government does is pay the whole tax 5% of 200 rupees, but then again, this 10 rupees that you have paid, the actual liability that you have to pay the government is 10 rupees here minus what is the input credit that you have to you have paid 5 rupees to your seller from whom you have purchased, that you can show as a credit and you will net pay only 5 rupees to the out of 10 that you have collected from the from your customer. Is that clear? Now, now yes. how is the customer? Because I have the extra pocket which I have taken from the customer. I can, if it's a competitor bit, I can add, pass it on to the customer by reducing my price of 200 to 195 or 196 rupees. So that is why I have say that the benefit of input credit of any stock should be passed on to the customer by way of reduction in basic price. Because you are getting a set off for the basic price, for the for the input, you must reduce your basic price when you are putting in my data. And that is why this set off must be considered when we are paying higher tax rate, you know, the statutory marriage. That higher tax rate that pay, he may be eligible by a higher set off. That should be passed on to Sir, मेरे अजाले में एक PO issue हुआ था मॉडरेट के साथ में और वो supply करते करते GST regime में आ गया उसके लिए फिर क्या किया जाए मतलब आपने order किया पुराने regime में 
और सप्लाई करते करते वो बैलेंस का हुआ जनरल की जीएसटी भी दिखा बहुत पुरानी बात है बस जी उधर सप्लाई सारा जाते हैं जी जी सत्रह 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 में दिया गया था अभी वो और अठारह में वो मतलब आ गया जीएसटी रिजिम में आ गया तो क्या क्या जब बंदर बंदर डिसन बदला जाए क्या मतलब एक्चुअली कि इस जगह के लिए प्रॉब्लम आई थी और रेलवे में जहाँ तक मुझे याद आता है स्पोर्ट्स में तो ये स्टैंड लिया गया कि स्टैटिटली � जहाँ तक मुझे याद आता है, under statute of variation clause, the revised tax were made to the form. Of course, we took a certificate from the form that any additional set of that is available to him shall be passed on by the as a part of reduction of prices. कोई input credit निकालने का तरीका क्या रेलवे ने provide किया है कोई formula? नहीं जी, नहीं जी, कोई formula नहीं निकाला गया है। हमारे इस पर जब calculate करके certificate देना है, अब तक आप सर कंट्रैक्टर बोल रहा था मेरे पास इनपुट पेडिट जीरो है दो सिस्टम में क्या किया जाए मतलब इस केस के लिए अगर आपको डाउट होता है तो एक प्रोविजन बना था उस टाइम पे अभी है कि नहीं मेरे दिमाग में अलग तरह का डाउट होता है कि वो प्रॉपर्ली डेटा को ट्रांसफर नहीं कर रहा है क्योंकि अथॉरिटी बनी थी इसको आपने कोर्ट कर सकते थे वही बात है ये बहुत पुरानी बात है आप देखेंगे आप एक बार आप नेट पे डालेंगे तो आपको मिल जाएगा but I am not very sure whether that part is still operational because there is a very old case I don't know why it was not handled तो उधर हमारा भी सप्लाई हुआ था अभी तक उसका पेपर नहीं है नेट टाइम ऑफ कैसी है लेवल पर ये माइरेल में माइक बेस ये तो बहुत पुराना केस है तब तो फर्म वाला I don't know फर्म कैसे One crore and thirty five lakh. One crore and the firm has still not taken it up. No more. Problem is creative because no formula is available for calculating the GST. How can we? Nobody is deciding. We cannot calculate. You can discuss with the firm. You can correspond with the firm. Yeah, but this one so I don't. 
uh, it is understood that the raw material is clean and skin subject to TSP. So the setup should be available to the firm. I must receive the peers that this is the wrong case, then it's not possible on the stock box. It may be investigated. That is all. After that, it may be possible to make a final opinion. We have to become a final opinion. That is all. Our hours, our resources, 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 insist the firm be all his finances and so he just cannot work and railway code has not given any formula for working out these there's no formula which has been given that there's no formula which can be okay fine okay sense to the clause done if it comes done it was done 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 purchase through gem gem is a new thing which you must all have heard of and it's coming in a big way पहले स्पोर्ट्स के लिए था सरप्राइज के लिए अभी इट हैज कम फॉर इवेंट सर्विसेज परचेज थ्रू जेम इज मेड अंडर सेक्शन 149 ऑफ जी एस वन टू सेवेंटी द रूल सेल इज मैंडेटरी टू प्रोक्योर थ्रू जेम इफ आइटम इज अवेलेबल ऑन जेम इफ एन आइटम इज अवेलेबल ऑन जेम मस्ट दूसरा इंपॉर्टेंट रूल है द रेट रीजनेबिलिटी द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ द प्रोक्योरिंग ऑफिस पहले रीजन नहीं होता था आर उसमें रेट इज नहीं होता है स्मार्टफोन ऑफ डीजीएस नहीं यू ओनली पेस इन पाइंट इन जेम रेट इज नहीं होता है वे ही ऐसे किसी को है कुछ तो देर आर फाइनेंशियल लिमिट्स और फॉर फाइव थाउजेंड यू कैन बोथ करेंट परचेज में जेम लाइक एनी अवेलेबल फ्रॉम कार्ड व्हाट एवर आइटम यू राइट लाइक ओके ऑफ कोर्स यू शुड टेक इंटरनल अप्रूवल इट्स नॉट लाइक एनीबडी कैन डू बट आफ्टर इंटरनल अप्रूवल यू कैन डू विदाउट डूइंग एनी कम कार्ड अप टू फाइव लैक्स यू कैन डू व्हाट फॉर द एलेवन परचेज Take any three. You can pass shortlist based on some factors. On out of the shortlist components, whichever was the lowest one, L1. If you want to purchase that, you can purchase without any bidding. That is called the L1 purchase. Based on filters, filter your present items available on the gem platform. Whichever was the L1, if you want to purchase it, if you are happy with that, purchase it without bidding. Above five lakhs or where, after filtering, you do not find the L1 as suitable for your requirement. You can. For a bidding or a reverse option. Again, here you select your specifications in GEM, float the bid, and the firm will offer based based on your specification. And then you can offer a you know uh, first check whether the offer is suitable. If suitable, it's suitable, open the financial bids. Then lowest offer is the order. Of course, now there is a provision to split orders even in GEM. Now, important things about GEM is strict timelines for acceptance and payment. This is where we have to tighten our belts. If we do not make this, uh, payment and time, there is a promotional penalty which we will give it these days. So we must ensure that the generation of the receipt documents and the payment is all done expeditiously. Okay. Uh, another thing that we must understand is what technical specifications and the management GMSPB add any new product or any commercial condition. The request has to be made. Then I cannot add on my own. Of course, now they have made some changes. You can add one or two conditions on your own. Other than that, any additional conditions you have to put gem to add. Contract that I have already discussed the basis. Let me not get what is when is actually to be and what is actually to be contracted. All these are not limited. But these are interesting things. If you are interested, please read. Very interesting stuff in law. Sale of goods act. The agreement to sell and the sale is a very important thing. All of those who have transacted in uh, immobile property know this. In store supply also is very important. What is property in goods? What is risk in goods? When does the property or risk in goods transfer from the seller to the purchaser? What is transfer to the purchaser? These are all part of sale of goods act. Very interesting. I will not touch upon them. Summary: A well-considered tender should have the correct technical specifications. It should not be vague. It should not be too restrictive also. If I make it too vague, I get sorted. If I make it restrictive, I restrict the population. Should have current eligibility criteria. Again, it should not be too restrictive or too broad. It is always better to have a standard and transparent criteria which you adopt as a leader in most of the cases. Third, it should have correct commercial conditions. I should not ask for a very short delivery period. I should not ask for uneconomic quantity. Suppose I am asking for Uh, you know, uh, uh, free on gas. And I ask the firm to buy only one cylinder of free on gas for one year. But 
example, it's not, it does not work out for it. So we have to see that the tender that I'm shooting for is commercially makes sense for the supplier also, otherwise it will not participate. I must anticipate what are the relevant conditions, as I mentioned, for purchase of additional gases. I must anticipate that the condition regards the free holding time of the cylinder must be caught in the tender. Otherwise, it will create a problem in the future. And if I ensure all these things, I lead to so an effective tender. It will be easy to finalize. It will give me the correct material at the correct price. Thank you so much. That is all from my side. You have been a wonderful audience. Uh, I really enjoyed discussing with you. It was a lot of discussion. So, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Hello. सर डायरेक्ट इंडेंट कर सकते हैं किसी सामान को परचेज करना रहेगा या उससे पहले उसका प्रपोजल मीटिंग होना चाहिए सर डायरेक्ट इंडेंट मतलब जैसे कोई सामान खरीदना है तो सर डायरेक्ट इंडेंट पे भेज देते हैं जब पहले डीएस टू होता था सर अभी वो इंडेंट डायरेक्ट करते हैं आई आई एम एस आई एम एम एस पर सर तो उसका पहले सर प्रपोजल का भेटिंग या कंकरेंस होना चाहिए कोई भी सामान सर जैसे ट्रैक मेंटेनर के लिए कोई सामान कितना है तो उसका डायरेक्ट इंडेट वो लोग कर देते हैं इस पर जो डिपार्टमेंट से समझ गया मैं देखिए ऐसा है आई आर आई एम ये वर्क फ्लो सो है ना वो बस आपको अलाउ करता है प्रपोजल फॉरवर्ड करने के लिए अप्रूव करने के अंदर एस ओ पी में कोई प्रोविजन है जिसके अंतर्गत उस प्रपोजल का कंकरेंस या वेटिंग चाहिए वो प्रपोजल और वेटिंग लेने के वेटिंग ऑफ कोर्स आई एम एस में हो जाता है बट प्रपोजल का कंकरेंस आई एम एस में आई थिंक प्रॉब्लम कंकरेंस साइमल्टेनियसली देना है उसके बाद ही इंडेंट भेजना है इंडेंट बनाना तभी पॉसिबल है जब प्रपोजल प्रॉपर्टी कन्वर्ड है और सैंक्शन सैंक्शन के बाद ही इंडेंट बनता है सैंक्शन पहले इंडेंट नहीं बन सकता और सैंक्शन के लिए कंकरेंस होती है तो कंकरेंस सैंक्शन ये सब फाइल पर लेना है चाहे ई ऑफिस पे चाहे पेपर फाइल पे उसके बाद आप इंडेंट बना सकते इंडेंट का वेटिंग वगैरह आई एम एस पे थैंक यू सर सर इसके ऊपर सर हेलो सर मैं सर सीनियर डिफेंस के डाल थैंक यू सर थैंक यू नो मैं सर सर वो बाइंड हेलो आर यू गेटिंग सर या नाउ आई कैन हियर यू थैंक यू ओके सर आई एम इन अप द एजुकेशन सर सीनियर डिफेंस मेरा पावर है मैं जिले जी कितने पावर है आई के एक कैट परचेस ओके सर थाउजेंड वन तो कितना निकल परचेस ओके एक बार ये शुरू ओके सर कैट कितने परचेस तो जेम अंदर तक आई डोंट थिंक दैट इट इज प्रॉब्लम बाय परचेसिंग विद जेम डू यू हैव अ परचेसिंग अकाउंट इन जेम सर बायर्स अकाउंट इन जेम हाँ Do you have a buyer's account in Jem? Mandatory, sir. Uh, no, the item is available on Jem. Yes, sir. It is mandatory to procure through Jem. Okay. If it is not available, then I can not available. You can, you can record on file that this item is not available on Jem, and therefore I am purchasing from outside. Then you can go from outside. Okay. Directly online purchase. Sir, uh, I will. Online means sir. Online means online. Sir. Online. Uh, I will purchase online. If I want to purchase the IT idea, some IT idea, uh, uh, in my power, it is possible. Ah. Yes. Can I purchase the power? Sir, the power is up to fifteen thousand. Can procure any IT item up to fifteen thousand without formal tendering, etc. But you yeah. have to record three things in file, sir. That is so important. Sir, three things. Number one. That the item has actually been purchased. Number two, that the item has been purchased at one more some uh, minor criteria. These three things must be recorded on file. Of course, you must also record now that the item is not available. Can be not available. And I can get the reasonables to be certified. Can I so far as it is not necessary? Like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. One more thing, sir. Uh, if I call. Oh, Any type of uh, item, ah, of which fifty five thousand can be purchased. Yes. Ah, sir, that time, what is the possibility?
purchasing on gem sir alex will be back on gem 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 sir the rule is about gem is that whenever you are procuring on gem it should be governed by terms and conditions given on gem so to purchase up to 25000 you have the option to go for direct purchase means you go to gem you choose the item you like and simply purchase you have to record the acceptance of file you have to take a sanction you of course you have completed the sanction also so you can record your sanction you can record your acceptance and you can purchase the item without bidding or the l1 counter at the same time, you have the option to purchase bidding or L1 comparison also, which also you can. So after 25,000, you have all the three modes of purchase. But if it is beyond 25,000, then there is a specific procedure of L1 purchase. Yeah. But I think as you said, your powers are only 5,000. So uh, unless you really want to go for L1 purchase, uh, just like any other Amazon of card, you can go to Gem, choose an item, purchase it, you have to record the rate is reasonable. That is all. Uh, the the of rates has to be required by the person. Sir, one more problem I am facing now. Uh, one one solution is expired. Uh, the uh, the okay, sir. Now, if it, uh, this is a solution that now comes to see. Only one may be available in the gym. Uh, one by one, please. 
Thanks.